Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about Kurosawa Desmet meets Thai security today. Um, this is joint work with Homa Gay and Dennis Hofheinz, and I'm Lisa, so good morning everyone. Um, as the session title already says, um, we're going to talk about public key encryption today. So um, you can see this uh, grinning cat here on the right, and she wants to communicate with Alice just to set you up with the notation. How can this be done? Well, Alice publishes the public key, and then the cat can uh, encrypt messages under this public key and send them to Alice. And of course, we want to be able to talk about security, so um, we consider an adversary here, and we don't only want to consider passive adversaries that can listen to the communication, but even adversaries actively interfering with it. So the model of security we have here is uh, in CCA security. Um, you can see the, the experiment here corresponding um, to this model. So the adversary gets a public key. He can choose two messages, M0 and M1, of the same length, send them to the challenger, gets an encryption back of one of the respective messages, and in the end has to find out which of the messages was encrypted. As we want to consider um, active security, additionally, we will provide the adversary with a decryption oracle, so an uh, oracle where he can query anything but the challenge ciphertext and gets the respective decryption. But this is actually not uh, quite what we, what we use, uh, quite the security model we um, want to use in this talk. Why is that? So in the real world, as you can see here on the slide, um, there's not only, we don't want to like have this, have this isolated uh, one person sending one message to, to, to Alice, but we have many, many more parties sending many, many, many more messages. So if we think of Alice not as a person, but as a server, this can be something like a billion messages or something like two to the 30 messages a day even. So what we really want is multi-ciphertext in CCA security. For multi-ciphertext in CCA security, as you can see, it's the same game. Um, but now the adversary cannot only query two messages, but many, many pairs of messages, and each time gets the respective encrypted message back. And uh, I didn't say this before, but of course, um, uh, we say a uh, scheme is secure if the adversary cannot find out this bit that uh, corresponding to the right message with a probability negligibly better than guessing. So yes. So why do we usually like why do we usually talk about in CCA security or not, and not about multi ciphertext in CCA security? Well, if you just care about asymptotic security, um, we're fine because in CCA security implies multi ciphertext in CCA security. Um, so, yeah, why do we call, um, care in this talk? Why do we directly want to work with this notion? It's because we care about the quality of the reduction. And yes, what, what do we mean by that? So how do we usually prove a security reduction? So how, we have some adversary breaking the encryption scheme with some advantage epsilon. And then to prove security, we want to reduce the security to some kind of assumption. So what we do is um, we construct an adversary breaking the underlying assumption, this, this rabbit here. Um, but the adversary will not have the same advantage usually. There will be, there will be some loss. So this, this L here, this is the security loss. Why do we have this loss in reductions? Well, for example, we have, because we have to guess something during the reduction. For example, going from in CCA security to multi ciphertext in CCA security, we basically have to guess where in which challenge ciphertext to embed the, the, like the challenge from the underlying assumption. So the loss will be in omega of the number of encryption queries we have. So if you now um, there's already concrete parameters in there. So if we want to have 128 bit security, we have to take a security parameter of 158 for the underlying assumption to actually have this security guarantee. So what I mean by quality of the reduction, like we, it's desirable to have a tight reduction. So L should not be, should in, in, in particular be independent of the number of encryption queries. So 
for example, like so what, what we call here tide reduction or often referred to as almost tide reduction, it should be like linear in the security parameter, some small constant desirably times the security parameter because then we will not have L to equal 2 to the 30 but something in the order of 2 to 8, 2 to 9, 2 to 10 but significantly smaller. So and then this will, this will yield um, shorter concrete parameters. So actually like generally we care about tight security reductions um, because we care about the concrete efficiency instantiating the scheme. Okay, so I want to give you a short uh, like walk through uh, some, some CCA secure encryption scheme in the line of our work. Of course, this is uh, not at all complete. So starting with the uh, Kramer and Shub 1998 and Kurosawa Desmet 2004, you can see two very efficient schemes in terms of ciphertext, also in terms of public key, but with a large, but you have the security loss. Um, in, in omega of the number encryption queries for the, for the reasons I just said. So uh, starting with the work of Hofeins and Jager 2012, there was, uh, there, uh, the, there was the aim to get tight security reduction, CCA secure encryption with tight security reduction. But as you can see here, um, the first scheme has a, has a like, it, it's not where we want to be because it's really inefficient. Um, the ciphertext size is linear in the security parameter instead of two group elements before. So we're talking about group elements here. Um, and yeah, there were, was a lot of progress um, made very recently. So um, 2016, um, Gay, Hofeins, Kills, and V um, improved greatly on this bound. They have a very short ciphertext, only three elements, but still suffer from a large, pu a large public key. So would be around 200 group elements if you, yeah, if you put in 128. Um, and then uh, just from this year, um, Hofheinz had a work with compact ciphertext and compact public key, but required pairing. So also um, a source of inefficiency. So the question starting that work was, can we do better? Can we have it all green? And the answer is yes, that's why I'm standing here. So we got a ciphertext size of three elements, a public key of six elements. We have a tight security reduction to DDH and we don't require pairings. So how does our scheme look like? So I can tell you in one line, our scheme is Kurosawa Desmet, the scheme you saw from 2004, plus one or proof pi, where this proof pi is some new proof. Okay, so you might have a number of questions now if you see that. Maybe the first question, in case you're not familiar, is okay, but how does Kurosawa Desmet look like? Or if you know, um, what is pi good for? Like, why, why do we need the pi? Why does pi suddenly enable us to get this tight security reduction? And the second question would be, how does pi look like? So yeah, in the following, I want to answer all of these questions. Starting, so stepping back a bit, going to, the, going to the foundations, and then explain Kurosawa Desmet and why it is not tight. So very short recap, um, the decisional Diffie-Hellman assumption. You saw DDH uh, on, on the slides before already in this table. So um, I, I want to start with defining uh, the Diffie-Hellman language because that is what we'll be working with later. So we have a group, and we have a vector, a group element, uh, a and t square, and we say, okay, the Diffie-Hillman language are all elements, respective to this vector a, are all elements that are linearly dependent of this vector. So by this multiplication, actually, like we're taking, we're taking the group elements to the power of the, of the scalar. So, so x1 is a1 to the power of w, and x2 is a2 to the power of w. And so for the following, uh, uh, you just remember that the, by bold, we, we always um, denote group, group, these group vectors uh, from, from t squared by bold notation. And then the DDH assumption um, uh, basically allows to, to, um, to switch between choosing a random element from this linear language LA to just um, choosing a, a linear like an uh, element from all t square, just randomly from t square. And uh, this is computationally indistinguishable. Um, we want this. And why is uh, 
it, this is a very nice assumption. It's a very nice assumption um, if you care about tightness, because then also if you don't care about tightness, but for us especially, because you have this re-randomizability. So if you get just one tuple, you can yourself re-randomize it to get many, many tuples. And the next ingredient we need is a hash proof system. So what's a hash proof system good for? Well, we will use it to prove that an X is indeed in this language. How can we do that? We know the witness, and we want to prove that to a designated verifier. And a hash proof system enables that by, um, by having two different mechanisms to compute a proof. Like you can publicly compute a proof knowing the public key and the witness, and you can privately compute a proof just knowing the secret key and the element, and you don't need to know the witness. And of course, we want to have some kind of security guarantees for that, and uh, that would be, or like we want to have security and we want to have some kind of correctness or completeness. So whenever X is indeed in a language, those two proofs should equal. So a designate verifier can compute a proof, then check if they're equal, and if accept, if not, not accept. And security, um, we want whenever X is not in a language, then even if you know the public key, you don't want someone to be able to compute this proof. Um, and even stronger for hash proof system, this should look completely random. So the private evaluation on this X should look completely random. So what's the one here? Um, the one here is supposed to mean we can only do this as long as we don't know any proof in the private evaluation, but this will actually be not good enough for us. Why is that? Um, this is not good enough for us because actually we want to have two universality. We want to be able to give out one proof and a public key um, for something and the proof outside the language and we will still want still to, to have universality to hold. So what we do is um, um, basically or what, what Kurosawa Desmond did in 2004, um, their approach was to linearly com combine two hash proof system and that gives them um, to universality, basically um, because some kind of computational to universality because this linear combination will be fresh each time due to the collision resistance of the used hash function. So now I can tell you Kurosawa Desmet, you have to, like, you know, have everything you have to know. So what do you do? Um, you first choose an X from the language with cor corresponding witness W. You compute the proof using the public evaluation with the public key and the witness. So public key, secret key are just the public key and the secret key of the hash proof system. And then you can just use this proof, that's why it's called K here, to um, encrypt the message with a symmetric encryption scheme. And then decryption, well, uh, decryptor has the secret key. He can recover this K and he can decrypt symmetrically. So um, correctness directly follows from the completeness of the hash proof system. Why is it secure? So it's secure because, again, um, we can switch. We, we first want to forget the witness, so we can switch from pub evil to priv evil by, by completeness, and then we don't need to know the witness anymore. So by DDH, we can switch to com um, the, uh, the how we choose x. We can choose x from all g square. And now um, we're done, basically, because now because of the computational two universality, we made the decryption oracle useless. Everything outside LA lin will have a K, which looks uniformly random to the adversary. Um, so, and then we can just use that the K um, that we used for the challenge query is random too, and we get in CCA security. So this is great, but what's the problem? Of course, there's no problem, but if we care about tight security, um, the problem is that entropy in the secret key is uh, limited. So, so this reduction cannot be tight. Why, why can this reduction not be tight? Because we relied that we only give out information about one of those key, only the key of this one challenge ciphertext. But if we do that many, many times, we don't have security guarantees anymore. We just have this two universality, but, but not more. So how does this prove pi? Just a short recap. Our scheme was uh, Kurosawa Desmet plus this new or proof pi. So how does this proof pi save us here? So the idea is um, we don't have enough entropy, so we need more entropy. So how do we get more entropy? We generate more entropy. We use not one secret key, 
but we use a freshly randomized secret key for each new ciphertext. And by doing so, we, we actually have enough entropy because we, yeah, we, we, that's what we did. And then we can re use the re-randomizability of DDH and use just one DDH tuple to randomize all ciphertext at once. So yeah, that's actually a technique of GATE all 2016. Um, but that well works works very handy. But the difficulty is, um, how can we answer decryption queries if we don't know the secret key anymore? Because um, now we use many many secret keys and not just one. So which one to use for decryption queries? And um, so before even thinking about re-randomizing the secret key, we have to do something else. We have to randomize the secret key, but but differently step by step. And um, how do we do so? How do we do so? So in each step, we partition the ciphertext space in, in two parts. So, so you see here in a blue part and a green part. And for one, we just generate the ciphertext as before. We choose X from LA and do everything as before. But now we also take another linear language. So we take LB. And for the other part, we choose X from LB. And for the blue part, we use one secret key. And for the green part, we use the other secret key. And now we can answer how can we um, answer the, uh, how can we answer decryption queries? Well, for decryption queries that has x in the one part, we just use the secret key we used for the blue part. And for decryption queries that have x in LB, we just use the secret key for the green part. But what do we do with the decryption queries that are neither in one part or the other? Well. We have to ensure that they are in one part or the other. And how do we do that? Uh, we can use, as who finds 2017, e explicit proof pi. But the novelty of this work is we do it without pairings. We do not require pairings for that. And why does this help? Like, shortly, um, this randomization helps because this um, enables us to just reject all decryption queries which are outside of LA, and then we can do the same as for Kurosawa Desma before. So this is why this rest yes use us. So now I can show you our scheme again. Maybe now it's a bit more clear how it looks like. Actually, you, you've seen everything you need. So um, we just have Kurosawa Desma, and then we additionally prove that X is either in LA or X is in LB. And we only decrypt if this pi is valid. So the main challenge of this work was like, how can we construct a pairing-free non-interactive OR proof? So why is, that, uh, why is that hard? So the problem is um, this is a disjunction of languages. So it's not as nicely as if you just have a linear language. Usually, you require pairings to do so. so how did, we, how did we solve this issue? Well, if you, if you take a look, if you go back to the encryption um, algorithm, what you do in the first line is you choose X from LA with the witness, and then you prove that X is in the disjunction. But actually, like, you always choose X from LA. You never choose, honestly, never choose X from LA. So this is great. So honest proof generation, we just need that for linear language. So we can employ a hash proof system. With hash proof system, we can do this pairing free. But of course, it's not as easy as that, because during randomization, we also sometimes have to choose X from LB and then proof, um, then give out simulated proofs for, for having it in the disjunction of both. So hash proof system, as I said before, same problem as before. We don't, we, um, by giving out something outside the span of LA, um, we, um, we, we, we give away all security guarantees. So the difficulty is how can we ensure that forging a proof for X outside the disjunction is hard? So the answer is um, just hide it. Just hide it whenever X is in LB. How can we hide it? Well, it's a kind of weird encryption that we can use there. It's, uh, the encryption is indexed by S. And um, we can encrypt the relation of the hash proof system. And this encryption scheme is in such a way that it will be lossy whenever X is in LB. So what do I mean by lossy? Just um, as, as uh, generally known, for all X in LB, whenever, like for any fixed K, whenever we encrypt this K, it just looks like a random encryption. So it doesn't leak anything about the evaluation of the hash proof system. So um, the security guarantees 
uh, will, so we will, the, the security guarantees will remain and, and we're fine. And so our all proof, I can show you a very simplified version of our all proof now. If you want to prove that X is indeed I times W for um, some scalar W, then you just publicly evaluate a hash proof system using W in the public key. Um, actually, now you, one universal hash proof system is good enough. And then you encrypt using this X, you encrypt the evaluation of the hash proof system. And that's um, it's, uh, this uh, proof, um, like the security notion you get, it's, 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 it's quite weird to be honest, but it's exactly what we need, and it gives us exactly what, it, what we want. So um, to conclude this talk, um, what, what, uh, what's, what's to take home? So the new, new thing of our work is this new efficient, pairing-free, non-interactive designated verifier or proof. And, uh, so we, and what we did was we reduced the cost of tight security to just one more element like compared to the, to the best scheme in this line before. It's just one, one more element in the ciphertext and less than a handful more element in the public key and we get this tight security reduction. So yeah, that's all I want to say for today. Thanks very much um, for coming here. Thanks for your attention. And yeah, I'm happy about questions. Thank you.